everybody has a purpose, everybody has a destiny, and this is an awesome opportunity to be able to find that, and you're gonna be fulfilled going into 2021 like you never have been before in your life. What's shaking? Welcome back to the All In Podcast. I'm your host, Rick Jordan, and I'm so pumped today. We've had a lot of pre-show talk with Crystal and Mark Hansen. Hello, my friends. Hello, hello. So happy to be here with you, Rick. I'm it's excited. Great honor, especially on the day of days, the day that starts the new year, a new life, uh, and a real entry into a decade that's going to be magnificently wonderful. I'm excited about this coming year. You know, I was really excited going into this year too, 2020. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Hey, look at this. But even through all this, there's just been so many learnings that we've had yeah. out of this year. And I'm not talking illness related learnings. I'm talking in business. I'm talking life. I'm talking destiny, really the trajectory of even my life and those that are around me. That's the part that it, that's excited me the most because I feel like 2020 was really like the year of revealing. You know, and going into next year, 2021, I'm really excited because your book out is the, the bridge from your dreams to your destiny. Ask. That's incredible. I yeah, we're it. so excited about this book and it's already changing lives, Rick. We're so we were, um, you know, we released this book in the middle of a pandemic, didn't expect to, but the release date was April 28th. And so we had a wow. meeting with our publisher and we're all like, what to do? Because most of the books, you know, the publishers are saying, just let's wait till fall. But all of us just kind of felt this buzz, like we have to go through with this, this, this book needs to be launched now more than ever. And thank God we did because we get letters every day of people saying this made all the difference for me. And so many people have been depressed and despondent and so uncertain. And it's just given them sort of the toolkit to move forward that they needed. I love that approach and that perspective because that's, that's what this year has been. You know, mm -hmm. it's just, uh, you get hit from all different angles and blindsided by literally everything. And where do you turn when something like that happens? Well, okay, so let's talk to that. We Our corporate symbol happens to be a butterfly, which you've seen in books like mine, One Minute Millionaire and all that. And what we're saying is, look, you cannot look at Caterpillar, understand Chrysalis, the cocoon, which 8 billion of us are in this cocoon, right? Or have been for an indeterminate time and then go into high flight butterfly, which is what we're saying is going to happen in 2021, where everyone gets to, I, I can only rhyme it with one rather than win. <laughs> but you know, the point is you don't get what you deserve you get what you ask for. And what we're teaching people to do is ask in three directions, ask yourself, ask others, and ask God. And what's happened is because we had a little bit of experience now for eight months in this cocoon, and people have read it and we're getting gazillion letters, but what we're asking people to do is look, get two when you get it from Amazon and go over every question in the book. Because what happens is we get to peel away the onion of this cocoon. It scared us, threatened us, caused us, like Crystal was saying, depression and despondency and upset and job loss, all the stuff that we all know. And we don't want, we want to go to the positive, not the negative. And the positive is what the subtitle is that we're, our destiny, Crystal and Mark's destiny with ask the bridge from your dreams, your destiny is get everybody to find their destiny. And as we do, we fulfill our life, everyone's life mission. That's fantastic. And I want to get it because I'm sure there's different questions really that you should ask yourself versus asking others and asking God. You know, it's a, there's those are different perspectives in themselves. But uh, here's one that's burning in my soul. Ready? <laughs> <laughs> nope. No. Nope. Awesome. You're probably not ready. <laughs> is ready. this this is the first book that you've co-written, correct? That's right. right. Yep. How was that process? You know, it's so funny. People <laughs> ask that quite often because it's like, how do you do that? And honestly, we didn't know what that was going to look like. We got excited about writing this book, but then we're like, how is this going to unfold? And it just kind of took shape so naturally. Mark and I just um, kind of took the baton where we're strong and ran with it. We both kind of came together and did the outline of the book and included all the all the you know basic principles and concepts that we saw should go inside. And then we both kind of took our pieces and, and wrote to those um, and ex just kept expanding the book. And then I'm kind of the final editor, so to speak. So I would you know take everything, push it together in the right way, and do transitions and things like that. 
And it just worked remarkably well. I, it was amazing. Mark was so good at, you know, because we did like 26 interviews for the book. So he's such a great connector. He made all those connections and got everybody excited about, you know, doing, doing the interview for the book and sharing their journey. And we did it in a different way. We, you know, for instance, like Peter Goober, you know, he's a billionaire, multi-billionaire. Um, and we didn't, we didn't want to know, you know, how'd you make your money and what are you doing now? It's, it was more about, tell us what it was like when you were a kid. How does someone, you know, start off and become a billionaire, you know, his, his simple life in the beginning and all those stories are just so powerful when you start to break it down in terms of what everyone's asking journey was and how those questions and answers at the right time, in the right place in the right way led to these breakthroughs and these successes in becoming the person that you become. And, and so it was just fascinating. We had so much fun doing the interviews and spending that time with people. That's fantastic. I once had an interview with Naveen Jain, who's a tech billionaire. You know, he found he founded uh, Infospace back in the dot com era. He was an executive with Microsoft. And I remember him telling me that, you know, as an entrepreneur, we always feel like we want to have the right answers to the problems, right? The right solutions. And he goes, no, the secret is having the right questions. You know, and yeah. that's something that's really stayed with me ever since I spoke with him. Uh, he couldn't be more right. We quoted Einstein in it. My teacher in graduate school is Bucky, Dr. Buckminster Fuller, who is Albert Einstein's best student, arguably, for a lot of reasons. All the inventions, 40 books, 15 doctorates at Harvard. But, you know, so I had a really great teacher. I'm not saying I'm great, but that I had great mentors. And, and what, what, what happened is, is that, you know, back with Peter Gubrus, you know, everyone now knows who he is, but as a little kid, He's shoveling snow and then he all, everybody wants him to shovel snow and he's a poor little Jewish kid in Brooklyn. And, and he said, wait a second, I'll hire my friends to shovel the snow. So he created called Enterprise Value. Then as a poor kid, he gets a scholarship because he's super smart, gets to a great Ivy League school and he asks himself, he said, hey, wait a second, what is happening here? I, I, I can't even date a girl. I can't take her to a movie. I don't have a car. And, and there he is, he they got to need something. What do they need? Yeah. They needed the clothes clean. Yeah. So he went to a dry cleaner and he went to a laundromat, got them to get it 50 off. And then he took 20 and they took 30. And he got 17 kids to do it. He made so much money while he's going to college and different schools that, that uh, he, they said, what else do you want? Because he kept asking the same question. They said, well, we want to go to Europe during the summer because we're all rich and we're going to take our girlfriends and go to Europe. So he gets, he was Priceline.com and didn't see how big a business that could be before it was. It flies everybody, graduates, marries the woman who we're great, we're great friends with Peter and his wife, Tara, for a long time. But the, the, he goes around the world. How many people do you know that graduate college and take a one-year trip all the way around the world, all expenses paid because he has all the other kids? Oh, sure. <laughs> but the point is, you got to ask, because everybody's suffering now, and 30 million yeah. people are unemployed, underemployed, or unhappily employed. And what asking does is it, it reveals who you really are so you can go out and do wonders. And obviously, Peter's got 50 Academy Awards, Batman, Rocky, Rain Man, and, and still making great movies. And then owns little companies like Golden State Warriors, and the Dodgers, <laughs> nothing important. <laughs> nothing small, yeah, nothing big, yeah. <laughs> he did it, and he says he did it by asking. And he said, other than him, he said, Mark, you're the most dyslexic guy I know because when people <laughs> tell you no, you are so dyslexic, you think they mean on. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I know you have an answer to one of those questions too, right? When somebody rejects you, what do you do? Uh, we teach a clean four-letter word in a book called N-E-X-T, Next. And, and when Jack and I wrote Chicken Soup of the Soul, which obviously sold a lot, a half billion books, is, it, is it, we kept saying next because we – I, I said, Jack, you got to be Teflon here. You got to. I know you went to Harvard, third in class, but you can't get involved in their negativity because they're wrong. We're doing audiences, and every audience gives us standing ovations for these stories. We put them in a book. We knew that it would work, and it just, you know, it unfolded miraculously. That's incredible. I'm really excited about these questions because you have to ask yourself, ask others, and ask God. I start to focus on the middle one because everyone feels like, oh, if I ask myself. You know, I feel like the, obviously it's kind of a misconception. I get that part of it, but the others part of it, cause I would love to focus on that. Cause there's a lot of, there's a lot of negativity, right? And you've heard the phrase that you're the sum of the five people around you that are closest to you. You know, so when you're asking those people, you know, sometimes it could be the wrong people, I, I would think, but other times, you know, when they really, when you feel like they're pouring into your life, 
What's the filter that you should put into place with the answer that they're giving it? Maybe this is in the book. I haven't read the whole thing yet, but is there a filter that you should have in place when you're asking others? Right. Well, you, you want to ask people that, that you respect, you know, and, and you want to ask people who share the same values, you know, or, you know, at least have that in common because, um, yeah, there's a lot of advice out there and maybe it's advice that, that it is in alignment with your values or you don't, if you don't have true respect for the person, um, then it's important, you know, to make sure that you don't ask a person who, if you don't respect their lifestyle, then you probably don't want to ask them, you know, for advice for your own life or whatever. But I think the th thing we find even more than that is people have such an aversion to asking. I mean, people are so afraid to ask other people for anything. And there have been studies done on this. And we looked at all the studies and people going into the studies um, pretty much universally feel like if they ask someone, you know, they're either for question or, you know, information or advice or for help on something, they're going to be perceived as being, you know, stupid, uninformed, ignorant, or pushy or obnoxious in some way, right? So we hold back. We're like really afraid to ask universally. And in the studies, they found that the opposite is true. If you're just willing to put yourself out there a little bit and ask somebody, there's an 80% more likely chance that they will, you know, grant your request, help you with something, answer your question. But people are so afraid. I mean, that's the one of the things we discovered with this book is that people have gigantic roadblocks to asking for things. And so um, we call them the seven roadblocks to asking. And they're really important to get in touch with because, um, like Mark said, you know, you don't get what you deserve in life, you get what you're, you ask for. And so many people, we found that, you know, the people who are massively successful and those who aren't, who just keep falling short of your success, their successes, it's not even about so much about talent and ability. There are so many incredibly talented people that we've been with, spent time with. And you kind of go, this person, this woman could be running a city or this guy could be, you know, the CEO of a company or running his own company. And he's barely getting by. What's the deal here? What is the disconnect? And really, it's the master askers are the ones who find the greatest success. So you have to get over those fears and understand what are my roadblocks to asking and where did they come from? Cause a lot of this stuff starts in our childhood. So it's so important to reckon with, you know, now if you want those things to change dramatically. Wow. That's, that's deep because I, I know you're right. You know, even thinking back to my own childhood, there was a phrase and I've talked about this maybe a little bit here and they're just sprinkled, but a lot of things I would ask for, or ask about, it'd be like, oh, you know what, not now, or we'll tell you when you're older, you know, th those, <laughs> those kinds of answers. And it's like, well, why do I even ask, you know, or, or I, you would go to a teacher in grade school and ask a question and they would say, well, didn't I just cover that? Well, I don't know. Maybe I need, need it to be explained to me again. You know, I love questions, you know, and I, I love asking them. I mean, you put yourself out there. There's always going to be the fear of rejection, Right. That, That's that, right. Yeah. And, and, it, and it grows, I think, for those exact experiences you're talking about, Rick, like we, we come into this world so, you know, uncorrupted as little children, you know, we want, we ask about everything, who, what, when, where, why, how, you know, we want to know everything. We're endlessly curious and we are not afraid to ask for more, 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 right? Because that's just our natural little human spirit evolving, wanting to experience everything. And it's beautiful and it's natural. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And then over time, depending on how we were parented, like you were saying, what happened in our school experience, you know, jobs, basic life rejection, that starts to get crushed out of us. That beautiful, natural curiosity, that ability to ask with, you know, without fear, without shame. And suddenly it just gets completely crushed out of us. And, and we stop getting what we want in life. We stop succeeding because we're just, we just become more fearful and less confident, you know, because, you know, now, now we're ashamed to not, not already have all the answers. Right. And, you know, or we think someone's going to reject us if we ask for something. So it's just so incredibly important to take the time to study that in the book and really recognize what your roadblocks are and where they started and because the minute you you do that, it's like this gate opens and you have this this wide open gate to walk through because it's just that awareness. You go, aha, this is what's holding me back. I love that. My oldest son, who's 13 now, I have twins, 13 year old twins. One's uh -oh. a 
Thank one's you. a boy, one's a girl, and then I have a younger son. The the twins are 13 now, but I remember my oldest son, his very first word was more, which in, in <laughs> itself was a question, right? Because after he learned manners, please, it's really a question, right? I'm, like, yeah, I'm never going to squash that. No. No, <laughs> I can't. So sweet. And that's what asking is about. We're entitled to more. Now I find the line from Albert Einstein I wanted to say, and I thought when by mumbling about his my teacher, if I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on the solution, I'd spend the first 55 minutes determining the proper yeah. question to ask. And once I had the proper wow. question, I'd solve the problem in five minutes. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I just I thought what you did to hitchhike on it, and then I thought I had it memorized. All of a sudden, I was going in and I couldn't. So I apologize to the audience and listening to you. No, you're fine. Then just this morning, too, my daughter, my 13 year old twin daughter, comes in and she goes, "Dad, I have a question for you." And I said, "Great, I love questions. <laughs> Ask away." <laughs> <laughs> oh, and did I you answer it? it. I oh, I it. sure did. Yeah, because she's actually going to even start writing some blog entries and start to learn my voice and everything. So, I mean, at 13, I've seen some of her work and she's just such a creative mind. It's like, let's get you involved in this right away. How do you feel about this? So this morning was questions about that. And it was, hey, dad, when can I start? You know? <laughs> Love that. So let's, Love get, that. let's hitchhike. And first of all, we got two grand, six grandkids, but two grand twins that are six years old. And then their older brother is eight. Yeah. And uh, we'll be with them tomorrow night, probably. But um, what's fascinating is that when the, when the eight year old was six, and we were just starting this book two years ago, we're in Hawaii on vacation when it was still legitimate to do, and we get a telephone call, and because he got for Christmas a Gizmo watch, you know, right. Dick Tracy talk him up watch. He calls up, and, and my phone says Gizmo, and and she and I are together, and I, he says, "Rampy, are you and Mimi together?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "Can I talk to you privately?" I said. <laughs> Son, you can talk to us 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for the rest of your life. You are the most important person to answer anything you want. What do you want? He said, you know those books you write? I said, yes. He said, are you and Mimi still writing books? I said, yeah. He said, can I write the next book with you? <laughs> and I looked at her. And so the first story we haven't asked is from Everett because he asked, he was honest, he was innocent, he was uncorrupted like Crystal was just saying, and, and it just... You know, it opened up our soul because we thought everybody is pure in their asking. They're, we're all born naked, ignorant, and ignorance, and, and we need to de-ignify with great question, asking the right question to the right person to get the right result. So you emanate out wisdom, but we've not been taught that. That's why what we've discovered is if somebody's going to get one of our books on Amazon, don't get one, get two, and go over it with whoever your important person is, your spouse, your business partner, your uh, church partner, like whatever that. Yeah. You. And, and go through each and every question in the book, and it will reveal what your destiny is. Because a lot of people say, well, I can't get a job, and I was a flight attendant, and they've fired all the flight attendants, and they're never going to. That, that is what you did. That is not who you are. And if you keep asking who you are, we're saying you've got to be it, to do it, to become it, and have it. And what we're saying is, look, the only way through is asking. Mm -hmm. That's why the line is asking, you shall receive it. You need to know how to ask. And we just think we put it together and the results that people are getting are just enormous by reading our book, Ask the Bridge from Your Dreams to Your Destiny. That's great. It sounds like what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, but when you have the right questions, you have the ability at that point to step into your destiny and where you're going without even necessarily having all the steps laid out yet or understanding even what the full picture is. You just know that I'm going to go in this direction and I can now. Right. And, you know, that kind of comes down to the ask yourself part. That is such a critical part. Well, each of those channels, because we say there are th the three channels through which you need to learn to ask, ask yourself, ask others, ask God. But really, each one of them is equally important. And the ask yourself part is that reflective journey. And it's really everything starts there because you need to take time with yourself to analyze your life through questions. I mean, so often in life, we're stuck. Um, things have gotten complicated. We don't know where to go. It happens again and again and again. So the only way forward is to sit and take that time with yourself in that quiet space and ask yourself the right questions to get those breakthroughs. And we say there are basically three critical phases of asking questions. And that first phase is, where am I now? Right? Because you can't really move forward until you understand where you are. How did I get here? What were the events that took place? Why is it working? Why is it not working? What needs to change? You know, and all of these things. And then the second phase, where am I now is the first phase, but the second critical phase of asking yourself is 
where do I want to be? And it's so funny, Rick, because we found with so many people, like very few people take the time with themselves to say, where do I want to be in my life? What do I really want? And then figure that out. And, and the only way you can figure that path forward and create that architecture for your life is by asking those questions. And what Mark and I like to say is start from the end in mind. So we say, go to the nth degree, whether it's, you know, you're trying to figure out what you want in a relationship or career or your health and fitness or your life purpose, whatever it is, start with the nth degree of a vision that you have of perfect success in your career or perfect relationship success. And then start asking those questions backwards. You know, what am I doing every day in my perfect career? Who are my clients? What conversations am I having with them? What appeals to them about me and my, or my business or my service? How do I, you know, create more business? All of these things, what, you know, what's important to me? What inspires me every day? And in that way, when you start with this vision and ask the questions backwards, it's like reverse engineering your perfect life, literally. And, uh, and then the final phase of that. So, you know, where am I now? Where do I want to be? And that final critical phase is what specific action do I need to take to get there? Because you really have to put your asking journey in, into action. You know, you can't just like, you'll start to get these breakthroughs. You'll ask a question of yourself. You'll keep asking different questions and you'll get ideas. You'll get a solution will come to you. A plan will start to form. Well, then you need to act on it. Right. So when you think of that person, like all of a sudden you asked a question, you're like, Oh, I haven't thought about that person. That's a perfect person for this thing. You know, you need to call them. You need to take action and put your action steps down and really log your journey. And we talk about that in the book and how to set that up and, and go forward with it. Wow. I, I, I feel that as you're going through those questions, uh, the part of the ask yourself, I think it seems maybe the first one is the most difficult. Because as I hear the, the question of where am I now, I, I share your perspective 100% that you have to know where you're at now in order to know where you're going. But in that sense, it's almost, you know, cause you've got the ask others and the ask God that are in here, but it's almost like the worst sense of rejection would be from your own self. Yep. And yes, asking <laughs> is the worst. Right? That's right. Sorry, I didn't mean to walk No, back. you're fine. No, no. And asking that question to yourself, where am I now? That's, that's putting the mirror in front of your face. I mean, if you go to Uber, let's say, cause yeah. we just got a little vacation in, in Florida with our relatives. Is it the first thing they do in Uber is where are you so we can come pick you up, right? <laughs> we, take you yes. somewhere. we can't take you anywhere until we know where you are and where you want to go. Those are the two things, right? We're at this hotel and we need to get to Tampa airport to fly out. And back when I was bankrupt in, in 1974, I asked the wrong question. I said, oh my God, what if I go bankrupt? Well, I went to the uh, library and I checked out a book, How to Go Bankrupt by Yourself. <laughs> <laughs> for six months, I was in a doldrum, slipping, sleeping in some of another guy's room in a sleeping bag. And it was the worst. But in that dark, terrorizing time, I started to ask myself, well, where am I and where do I want to go and what do I want to be? And, you know, and then sort of intuitively, God told me, you know, you want to talk to people that care about things that matter, that would make a life changing difference. I went, whoa. That's it. So I'm going to run downstairs. We're having breakfast with three roommates in Hicksville, Long Island, New York, really literally where I live. And I said, guys, is there anyone young speaking as a professional that is not a lawyer, not a doctor, not a celebrity, not a Broadway star, because we're in New York, and not a movie star? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this kid a little older than you. He's out in Hawpaw, Long Island. He's turned all the world over. He's a wow. You'll love him. I race out to my $400 pitted window, permanently air conditioned Volkswagen and <laughs> freezing my butt off. I get there and Chip <laughs> Collins, who later became my great friend, mesmerized people for three hours. I mean, just, I asked him, I walked up to him when he was done. I said, Chip, can I take you to lunch? I'll buy. I want to ask you how you do this business. He said, look, kid, chance of you making it is one in a thousand. You ain't going to make it. So I think you shouldn't waste your time. I said, look, I'm buying. Let me ask you the question. He told me what to do, how to do it. And I did a thousand talks a year for the first three years. And then at those talks, what happened what was miraculous. And mm -hmm. people kept saying, yeah, that story in the book. So the first book I did was stand up, speak out and win. And I tripled my income in one year. I, I sold 20,000 books to little audiences, six people. Yeah, 20, yeah. 50 was a big audience at a time. And I said, this isn't a national bestseller. It's 
I'm not a New York Times bestseller, but it is my bestseller. <laughs> I want to find it to you and your teenage twins and your other kid and your dog, Rick, if you have one. Oh, thank and you. That's what you do. You smile. And I signed 20,000 books, made $200,000. Well, in 1974, that's like $2 million today. Yeah, so yeah. I, I had, because of questions I had arrived, I asked Chip. I knew what I wanted to do. I want to talk to people that care about things that matter and make a life-changing difference. I asked another, how do I do it? He told me what to do, although he kept saying, hey, look, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it, which that's back to what you said a couple of questions ago. You, each of us have to be Teflon, rejection-proof, and just keep saying next. Somebody's going to say yes. There is somebody out there to help us. So if you ask the right people that have the right attitude and, and the ability to do something for you, more often than not, they'll do it like Crystal was just articulately saying. Yeah. Mark, I have a question for Crystal. So Crystal, because Mark, what you, being men, we tend to try to be a little bit more macho, right? So, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a little bit more hard for us to be vulnerable. It's just the truth, right? So Crystal, <laughs> that I mean, all the questions, but especially the first one, you know, where am I now? Is that more difficult for a man to answer than a female, than a woman? I think it is. You know, yeah. I, I think sometimes it, it just takes a lot of courage to be honest with yourself, you know? And uh, I think sometimes that feels more threatening to men because men want to feel like they're in control. I mean, one of the biggest fears for a man is to not be in control. The biggest fear for a woman is to have too much to do. I mean, those are such mm, different wow, fears, yeah. right? <laughs> right. The, the biggest stress for men is not to be, you know, to not be in control. The biggest stress for women is to have too much to do. But um, yeah, so I think that that is sort of like admitting, like, where am I now? And like breaking yourself down. So it's like admitting, well, maybe I'm not in perfect control and I need to sort of break this apart, you know, and mm. deconstruct it a little bit so I can put it back together. And that, you know, it's a little bit of a journey. So it really takes a commitment to yourself and, and you know, kind of being willing to be courageous and honest with yourself, answer, answer those questions courageously. Sure. I can definitely see the benefit to a man and a woman going through the book together at the same oh, yeah. time, because I could see the last question in that series, what actions do I need to take being right where a masculine man would want to go to, because we want to try to fix things right away. What can I do right now? Right. Yeah. G give me right. some steps, you know, not an instruction booklet. Cause I'm going to just throw that out, but just give me something that I can do immediately to try to fix this thing. It's so universal. <laughs> Here's the answer. Let's go to the big one. Ask God, right? Yeah. So what we're teaching in the book is you ask yourself 400 times before you go to sleep because in subconscious never sleeps. So it's out, always out doing your doing. So you say, God, what's your destiny for me? God, what's your destiny mm -hmm. for me? God, what's your destiny for me? But you got to tell your sweetie, cause, hey, honey, I'm going to wake up at <laughs> some odd time. I listen to Mark and Crystal. They're sort of wacky. But, it, you know, they said we got to have a pad and a pencil next to the bed. And I'm going to have to turn on the lights because I got to write in detail because you've already got your answer, right? I mean, Christ said the kingdom of heaven is within. It's not outside. It's not somewhere out there. Your inner being knows what you're supposed to do. And, and you got fired yesterday, Bubba. And, and, you know, I don't feel good about myself. And you start to shut down and get scared. And you go to your lower self rather than your higher self. This way we go to our higher self, our spiritual self, our divine self. You came in here coded, ready to do something. And the best example I can give is, when Jack and I wrote Chicken Soup and Soul, we had the wrong title. Hmm. We agreed to do what is called, I, what I just taught as a thought command. We said, mega best song title, mega best song title, mega best song title, mega best song title. 2.58 in the morning, Jack calls up. The whole house wakes up because we didn't have cell phones yet. They weren't existent. So when phone rings, you go, oh, my God, the house on fire. The neighbors <laughs> and one of my kids stole the car, whatever. Yeah. Right? And Jack says, Chicken Soup. I said, for the soul. And both of us got goosebumps. We knew exactly oh, wow. what was hitting. It wasn't maybe. Now, 144 publishers were going to turn us down. <laughs> 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 yeah, that was journey. Wow. <laughs> and then, oh, I forgot one other subset. Yeah. Our agent fired us too, just so he said, look, you guys are never going to sell this book. It's too nice, too nice. People aren't going to buy it. And then I think we've done okay. So everybody out there has got to understand if somebody rejects them, it's their problem, not your problem. Right. I mean, who keeps asking when you've been rejected 144 times already? <laughs> <laughs> that's the I mean, best that's... salesperson in the world, Mark. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Maybe I'm not that smart. <laughs> <laughs> It works. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> uh, I'm sure going through this process too, it probably, you know, because I'm sure it was, it was beautiful. You said that writing the, the book together, but 
I'm sure going through these things, I know in any creative work that I've ever done, I mean, even in, in just a podcast episode, there's a lot of internalization that I tend to do. And did you go through the same kind of experience in starting to ask yourself these questions as you were writing the book? Well, yeah. And what was really fun is to see how it all gelled with the life we've lived and how our, we could, you know, go back and sort of dissect how our journeys, asking journeys had, had unfolded and had impacted our lives so dramatically. I mean, when we really started to look at it, like, oh my goodness, it was that question at that time Mm. that made all the difference and following the answer and having the courage to, you know, to go with that answer. It's just, it's astounding, really. That's great. Where did you come up to, and this is, where was one of the most frustrating parts for you in in writing the book? Was there someplace you got stalled that you're like, man, I just need to find something to break through this? Yeah, let's see where we got stalled. Um, You know, it was tricky. (laughs) I think the most frustrating for me, because I did like all the final edits. So we had all these incredible, you know, um, interviews. And some were really easy. So we'd edit the interview based on everything they'd say exactly. And then you'd go back, do the first pass and say, please correct anything that we want this to be really accurate. And they'd be like, oh, no, that's not right. That's not right. That's not right. You know, and want to make some changes, which is fine. No problem with that. And then you'd change it. And then a couple of times, a few people were really particular. And so they go back again and again. And again. <laughs> I mean, we just had a couple like that. And you know what? I just tried to be really patient because I understand it's their journey and they wanted it to be perfect. I mean, most of them, like people were so responsive and like, this is great. I love this. I love, I love how you wrote it up. And, you know, but it was just really funny how some people are kind of have a harder time being happy with, you know, like it basically was really their own story. We just wrote it a little better and like fix anything you want. And then they'd fix it and then you'd put it back to them. And (laughs) (laughs) she's saying the frustration, because remember, I've done literally editing thousands, tens of thousands of stories because we got, you know, 254 chicken books and I've written 312 books total. So I think I know something about editing and improving a story. (laughs) Maybe a little. Yeah. You know, (laughs) know, it's like Dr. Canfield, Jack always used to say, how the hell do you do that? You reshuffle it, make it better. I don't know how you do that. (laughs) It's one of God gave each of us talent. That's one of my talents. So, and I'm very thankful for it. So I'm not making light of it. I'm very blessed, but these people come back and they'd say, that isn't the way I told it to you. And I said, no, no, but the way we're telling you works for the reader. That's what we're trying to do is the book is for the reader. It's not for you. Right. And and they all ultimately uh, agreed, but boy, the amount of telephone calls to renegotiate because these are famous people. Most of them yeah, are pretty yeah. famous people. That's incredible. A lot of, there's some ego that comes into play like that too. And I've started to realize over the years that I'm actually not the best at telling my own story. <laughs> it, it, it takes really, really smart people like, like the two of you, Mark and Crystal, to to extract those things out of me because the details of a lot of the nuances of your own story are kind of lost. So when somebody- They are. I, I think people don't realize how difficult it is to write a story. Even, you know, if someone gives you all the facts of, of their life, it is very difficult to pull a really great readable story out of it. And I, and I feel so proud of the book. I feel like we have just some incredible stories um, and people, they're really touching people. And the great thing about stories like that is stories are metaphors and, you know, metaphors are like a pattern for, for our brains, really our brains think in patterns. So when you read someone's story and their journey and their, you know, setbacks and their breakthroughs, it's like, you sort of borrow those benefits as you're reading and you learn very quickly. You learn those lessons without having to go through the pain and trouble, but you also relate to them because there's a little bit of, of each of us in all of us. I, I love to say that because I really believe that, you know, human experience is kind of universal. So there's just so much power to those kinds of stories and what we can learn and, and how we can benefit from them. If I can add it, Rick, is it, is it Crystal when we're doing this, starts writing this thing called the fable of Michaela and she did it in four parts and I'm reading it. And obviously I got to edit her and she's editing me. And I say, sweetie, we're not going to do this in four parts. She said, no, no, no. You can't tell me how you're going to do that. I said, no, no, I'm not telling you how you're doing it. It is so magnificent, so poignant, so powerful, so terrific. You know, everybody needs to know a story. And and there's, no, we've had, I'll tell you what happens after that. 
But I said, we got to squish it together and we're going to call out a prologue. And, and so we've had a bunch of people say, that's the world's longest prologue. You ought to get a Guinness Book of Record for it, which may happen. And I don't know if you've read it yet, but The Fable of Michaela is this magnificent story. It's, it's what Shakespeare said when you're writing, write the story of every man and woman. What Crystal was just saying is a little bit of all of us. All of us need each of us, each of us need all of us. And <clears throat> we get letters now, stacks every day from here. I read that. It touched me so much. I, I, I cried and I read it to my wife. And then I woke so up my kids and I read it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, when you read it's it to your amazing. teenagers, or better yet, have your teenagers read it to you it'll, and have them read a paragraph at a time. It'll, I promise you the story will own them and they'll own it forever and one I share with all their friends. Well, That's and it was incredible. interesting when I wrote The Fable of Michaela, it sort of just flowed out. It just took on a life of its own. And um, it, it's been so powerful for so many people. I just feel like it was meant to be. And it, it, because it starts off, this woman, it takes place in the time of kings and queens, right? And she's lost everything. Michaela has lost everything. Her mother was sick. Her father, um, you know, had to basically borrow to pay all her medical bills. And he ended up dying of stress before her mother died. And then her mother died shortly after. So she's lost both of her parents. And then they took her home away from her to pay to the bill collectors took, took it away. So she has nothing. She's lost everything and she's lost all hope. And she's sleeping in a grove um, of trees. And one night she, she's working at a, she's basically an indentured servant at the stone quarry. And so her day is just about moving heavy rocks from one place to another. And one night she goes home to the, in this, and falls in this exhausted sleep. And in this dream, this being comes to her. And he takes her on this journey and he shows her this beautiful sparkling bridge and says, you know, Michaela, you know, every decision you make in life is so important and it will lead you closer or further away from your destiny. And the key is to ask and never stop asking. And then she wakes up from that dream and she already knows something big has changed inside of her. So every day it's like she wakes up a little bit more to you know, her curiosity to wondering, to asking, and, and her life just starts to open and build and expand and expand and expand. And by the end of the, of the fable, her life is completely transformed. And it's just, it's such a fun story. People are like, I read this three times. It just, and I cry every time. And it, you know, it's just, so, it's really amazing. It, it's a fun story. That's incredible. I love seeing your face as you're telling this too, especially when you describe the reactions of the lives that you've touched. You know, how does that feel for you? Because I'm sure you get lots of letters, you know, or, or emails and, and listen to me letters as if it's 20 years ago, emails. Talk, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 We, we talked in like 80 countries and, and uh, it works as well in America when we got big audiences here or when we don't go to China for the last three years, but up until then we'd have gigantic crowds and they don't want to touch us. And we they yeah. literally, it's going to sound it's crazy to you, and it sound crazy to us. At first, I didn't like having bodyguards. I thought, no, no, I'm not Elvis Presley. I'm not a rock star. Yeah, I'm just the yeah. world's best-selling author. But people would, we check into a hotel, and they'd dive over the counter at us, and i go, whoa, whoa. You know, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. In China, they don't have but a few books, and, and our book was accepted by government because they never understood the word you said when we started this, the word soul which is that electric light of spirit and divinity mm. that's in each and every one of us. And, and, and the Chinese, which to be communist means to be an atheist, which these people right. are not, the government is, but the yeah. people, when we talk, and I hope I'm not over answering your question too much, but they would ask us questions and all the questions ended up coming back to her because they were spiritual and they wanted <laughs> to make sure the sensors in the back didn't go, take Mark and Crystal away and we'll never see them again. Sure. It's just that imperatively important. No doubt it is. And it, having that feedback from everybody too, that's a drive to keep you going. I mean, uh, imagine if you wrote your first book, Mark, and you had no positive feedback or anything from that. Would you keep well, going? I, one, I would be in trouble. <laughs> yes, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. that's, a, would, would you say that's destiny, your... though, Rick, what you're really saying, the subtext, and forgive yeah. me for running over you, but it is the subtext is everyone's got destiny. Yeah. And when they get on their right path to their right livelihood, to their right activity, and they're really being their best, highest self, everything starts to unfold and it becomes smooth, beautiful, and perfect. Well, and like you were saying, Rick, I I can 
vouch for Mark. Like I can't even tell you the number of people who come up to him and say, the, your book, The Chicken Soup with Soul Books, changed my life dramatically, mm-hmm. you know, saved my life basically. And thousands and thousands of people. And, and that is so important because a book can do that one book. I mean, and that's what we're seeing with ask again. So it's super exciting. Like you can buy a $16 book and you come away with this new perspective. That's like, you're not stuck anymore. It's taking you to a new place. It's such a beautiful thing, you know? I love that. And then, Mark, you're right. It's okay that you walk all over me, buddy. It really is. When, cause <laughs> <laughs> no, you're fine. Because I, I, that was going to be my question because it's like you, you are literally seeing your destiny in action, which is amazing. Oh. And, and destiny, you know, everyone thinks, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? And destiny really is, th- there's a tag to that. At least my personal view on it is what yeah. am I supposed to do for others? You know, because this is a, we're, we're on this planet and we're, we're not here by ourselves, yeah. you know, and this comes to the, I believe the last question that's here is ask God and God didn't create us to be silos of human beings. You know, we're created to, to literally serve everybody else, you know, and that's why I, this year I had such a hard time wrestling with, even though I have a cybersecurity company and essential versus non-essential, I was essential but I had such a hard time with individuals being labeled as non-essential. I know. You know, because everything, that, and this is probably one of the toughest parts of this year that we've gone through, and going into 2021 being New Year's Eve now, looking at that, it's like, no, everybody was created to be essential. That's right. Period. It's, well, it's I- not what, what we do, it's really about who we are. That's where our destiny lies, at least to me. And going into this year, what would you have to say to those who have been labeled this year? Because that's a hardcore label to be labeled non-essential. Yeah. And let's just go to the biggest, the macro. There's 8 billion of us on the planet currently. That's the world's population. 4 billion of us can't read, but 4 billion of us, all 8 billion have a cell phone. And for the first time, they can listen to your podcast and get what my colleague Zig Ziglar used to call a checkup from the neck up, because from the neck up, you go up. (laughs) And they can start to learn to talk right, ask the right questions, get the right results, ask how do you meet that person? Because all of us need to meet other people to fulfill our destiny. And then what you're really saying, the subtext, the big guy said, the greatest amongst you is servant of all. You yeah. and I are here to serve at levels we never thought we could serve before because before podcasts, you could get to a few and you're a little radio guy or something. But now with podcasts, for the first time, we're all going to get to go to all the way around the world. And I really believe we're going to include everyone and not exclude them. Because what you're saying about you're not essential, you're not included. Yes. <laughs> and if you're not included, you're not going to eat. You're not going to have money for your rent. You're, you're going to Han Mama. It unwraps. You got it. I don't think I've told this story. On the, I'd love to share it with you because, I mean, we share similar perspectives on this, too. There's a there's a pastor friend of mine who's coming in here for a, the Christmas episode, like we were talking a little bit before the show. And he was in the movie that I just produced, too, Liberty Lockdown, uh, talking about the church being labeled as essential versus non-essential and how can God be labeled non-essential. But <sighs> lifting people up for Christmas, you know, as he's been on the show here now with him, when I speak with him, I mean, it's just amazing the perspective that he has on this, you know, and telling people, it's like, listen, we, we are created to be human beings and we're created to be around other human beings. And when we're here to serve everybody else, that's really what we're doing to fulfill our destiny. Because if we're siloing ourselves, what, what good is all the money in the world, really, if you're not going to use it to help other people? You know, to me, even just that is a tool. Exactly. And you know what? I I love that. I feel like one of the most important questions that I personally ask God is, what is my purpose in in the kingdom? Okay, because it's not just about me. And you know, when you ask that question, it takes so much pressure off. We're not like you said, Rick, we're not meant to be an island here by ourselves. We're not meant to be the Lone Ranger. We are here as as a part of this beautiful creation that our creator created. And we're all a piece of it. And we're all we all share that light and that that bond. We we need that bond. We need to be together. We need to be feeding each other and helping each other. And uh, and actually asking questions creates a bond between two people. Because when I ask you something, I'm listening. I'm t- I'm finding out about you. You know. And so that's why the asking journey is so important. But the most important question we can ask is, what is my purpose in this in this beautiful universe in this beautiful kingdom? It's bigger than me. 
And that makes it so much more meaningful. It makes it so much more exciting. Um, And I think it makes for much better mental health because I think otherwise we tend to be narcissistic human beings. Get, we can all be oh, narcissistic yeah. or it's just, Oh, it's about me. I've got to be the best. I have to, but, but when it's not just about you, it's about this, what is your purpose in this beautiful kingdom? And that it's just, I love that question and everyone is essential. And that has almost driven me crazy. Like this non-essential essential, <laughs> like, okay, all the workers at Amazon in these big warehouses, they're essential. And, you know, Jeff Bezos is what, billions and billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars richer. Yeah. But this, you know, guy and or his wife or somebody, a woman who has a little restaurant that feeds people who work hard every day, they're not essential. Or, you know, it, it's crazy. You know, the Costco workers are essential, but, you know, the people cutting hair and, and taking care of people's, you know, hair and that type of thing, they're not essential. Mm-hmm. Who Who got to decide that, you know? For sure, Crystal. Um, and taking that, I even went beyond in my mind to beyond their job. You know, it was almost putting a label on their life at that point, because if they're unemployed at that point, you know, a lot of people find a lot of purpose, at least maybe it's misplaced purpose in their job just because of what they do rather than who they are. And who they are is usually serving other people. And look right. at hospitality. It's like, well, that's literally a job of service <laughs> it is. Uh, for, for everybody else. And now all of a sudden you're saying, well, so I'm sorry, your purpose or your destiny doesn't really matter. And there's <gasps> a lot that are still in that boat going into the new year here. And I, I would love us to just encourage and please, Mark, Crystal, jump in here because everybody's essential to me. You know, everybody has a purpose. Everybody has a destiny. And you know what? Maybe this was that year of revealing, like we started out talking at the beginning of the show to say, you know what? Maybe what you were doing, those actions you were taking is not your true destiny. And this is an awesome opportunity to be able to find that. And you're going to be fulfilled going into 2021 like you never have been before in your life. Yeah. And using your hospitality thing, because we just had that little vacation down in Florida. There's nobody working in the hospitality and a lot of the hotel restaurants are closed, which broke our heart because we're talking about tens of millions of Americans oh, that yeah. are good people, hardworking people. They've got family. They've got kids. They're no different than, you, than the three of us and, and they deserve it. But So we're saying, hey, look, we don't know a better way. And, and we've been testing it and everyone we've met, get a copy of Ask, actually get two and go over it with somebody and really find out who you are here to become because- a lot of people never discover it. One of the stories we have is, of course, the two greatest musician, uh, musical orchestrators in America both got kicked out of school at 13. And you know their mm-hmm. names. One is a guy named Quincy. And he made somebody named Michael, Michael, Michael Jackson, right? And the other guy <laughs> is David Foster, who's our dear friend. And David, we're all in Horatio Alger Award winners. But here's a guy who got kicked out of school at 13 for being technically uneducable. Well, he's a world's great. He made Barbara Strides and he made... Uh, uh, Whitney Houston and, and uh, Celine Dion. I get goosebumps telling you that, so I hope I'm not going too <laughs> You're far, good. ladies and gentlemen. But the point is, he, just like you, some of you have been fired out there and you're hanging on by your fingernails. And I've been there, I don't know enough about Rick's story, but I'll bet anything he's had somebody punch him in the gut metaphorically, if not physically. <laughs> and, and, you know, big business, right? Because you yep. don't build a big cyber business without having some hiccups. The point is, there is a destiny for you and there's an opportunity for you. And, and what we're here to do is say, hey, we're cheering you on. We're encouraging you because we're enthusing you because enthusiasm is a Greek word in the spirit, in the spirit within show without. But you got to light that candle inside. And, and all we want to do by going to our website, we give you free books and stuff. And, and what we want to do is enlighten you. So you lighten your spirit. And when you have a light spirit, you get a job. It's like. Right. One of the podcasts we were just on, the guy said, Crystal, I can really see your spirit. And, and, and that's what I saw. I saw her spirit and I fell indefatigably in love with her and we made it happen. <laughs> Mark, you are just incredibly adorable, my man. And it's... Oh, <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> I, I am secure enough as a man to be able to tell another man that too. So, there. <laughs> so adorable. Yes. Crystal, you're, you're awesome. Mark, you're amazing. <laughs> That was the perfect way to, to bookend this, you know, to pun intended. But the book is Ask, The Bridge from Your Dreams to Your Destiny. I'm excited for this. I'm going to get copies for my kids because I, I feel like yeah. they, they're at such a critical point in their lives too. But thank you. You've really enriched my life today. And everyone who's listening going into 2021, just 
get the book, get two copies of the book. This is what we've got to do because it, if you were labeled non-essential this year, I'm sorry, that's a lie. That's a lie. So Mark, Crystal, thank you so much. I'm excited yep. to stay connected with you too. <laughs> We're excited too. And let me know. I want to hear back after what your kids think of the book. I love hearing. I love it. Yes, for sure. Amazon, anywhere books can be found, right? Yeah, anywhere books can be Beautiful. found. Beautiful. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, my new friends. Thank, Thank you, you, Rick. Enjoyed it Thanks, so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. What's shaking? Thank you for joining me on the All In Podcast. Click the subscribe button and smash that bell for notifications. Text me, 312-535-8520 follow me on social media at Mr. Rick Jordan. See you next episode. I am Rick Jordan and I approve this message.